work with and represent digital media design students, broadcast electronic media art students, fashion, photography, and cinema students, and I coach people to get to the next level as they deem fit. Today, it is with great esteemed pleasure to have <coughs> careers in animation and illustration. Make some noise! housekeeping issues. Number one, uh, bathrooms are outside. Number two, I respectfully ask that you please put your phones on silent or turn them off. As you can see, this is a live taping and you are the studio audience, so I'm going to need lots of love and support from y'all. Um, did everybody receive a note card from the check-in? Okay, excellent. If you, those no cards are for you to write down questions for our panelists. The run-up show is going to look like this. I'm going to ask some questions for a little bit. They're going to chat. We're going to take a 15 minute break. I'm going to collect those no cards and then I'm going to sift through them, aggregate them, and then I'm going to ask the studio audience questions of our panelists. And so hopefully we'll get a chance to kind of get a mixture of everything. Um, and that's about it. So. Panelists, yes. thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to start with the infamous question, tell us about yourself. And it's okay, I'd like to start with you, please. Oh, no, no. Just um, um, my name is Saran Norris. Uh, I'm an artist here in San Francisco. Uh, I've been in San Francisco for like over 20 years. Um, uh, over nationally, I'm known for one of the three people that, that helped create Pops Burgers. We did it in the mission like 10 years ago. Um, I design everything that you see, the characters, except for Tina, uh, the houses, the inside, the restaurant, all that. Um, it was actually going to be made here in, in San Francisco. We made it in 2008 during the financial crisis, and our goal is to try to make a show that was made in the United States. Uh, it didn't work out. Fox bought it. Everybody moved to L.A. Uh, but uh, other than that, if you go around town, you see like uh, light blue bears that are around in murals and stuff like that. Those are all mine. I have my own garbage truck. I work a lot with the city, so I have murals in San Francisco General Hospital and uh, Sutter Hospital on Geary, and uh, I have I have like so like maybe thirty or so murals all throughout San Francisco. Uh, there's a map on my website, uh, and I like to play video games on the side and on Aquarius. Yeah, <laughs> bring in the instrument. <laughs> Do you need this closer to us? No. Uh, hi, so my name is Fanny Moore. Uh, I'm an illustrator at Dropbox, and I've been there for about five years. Um, it was It's my first full-time job out of college, so I feel like uh, I might be able to relate very closely to where y'all are sitting today. So, uh, yeah, and uh, I'm from Seattle originally, and went to the University of Washington, studied graphic design, even though that's not exactly what I practice now, so a bit of a career shift there, if that's interesting to anyone. And I am a Virgo. Hi everybody, I'm Melanie Chapko. Uh, I work as a visual note taker, which means that I go to events and meetings at Fortune 500 companies, uh, and I make those meetings less boring. By, like I listen to the conversation and distill it into the meat and potatoes of what they're saying and at the end produce a cartoon summary of everything they talked about. Um, I also do studio illustration work, so I work mostly by hand with markers and tape and stuff, uh, but I also use Procreate, Figma, Photoshop, a little bit of Illustrator, even, but Illustrator kind of scares me still. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Cancer, Libra Rising, John. <laughs> uh, I'm Charlie. I'm a drawing animator, a drawer. Uh, I've self taught, um, been doing it for over 30 years though, and studied graphic design in Seattle at a Podunk Community College, but we won all the awards. Uh, and then I moved down here, worked at ILM, Colossal, Wild Brain, uh, freelance doing sequences for um, documentaries for a long time. Uh, so there you go. And I'll leave it up to you to guess my astrology. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'll work on that. Excellent. Thank you, panelists. And the question I'm going to ask you, anyone can jump in to take. There's no order. Um, I would love to know what you wanted to be when you were younger, 
right? Like, I know I wanted to be an archaeologist. Thank you, Harrison Ford, and <laughs> Jones films, and obviously that didn't work out. So I'm just curious to know, what did you want to be when you were young? I wanted to be an artist. I knew exactly what I wanted to do my whole life. And I knew I wanted to be a commercial artist, not like a, you know, painter or whatever. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, I wanted to, like, uh, draw cartoons, and, you know, something that was for a mass audience. Thank you. Um, I definitely wanted to be an artist of some sort. I feel like uh, I... I made like little children, like little picture books when I was younger, so there's always like a writing component. Uh, so I briefly entertained journalism at one point, but that was really hard, so I <laughs> went back to drawing, which is what I deemed myself to be better at. Um, so yeah. um, I, th I remember at one point thinking I could combine marine biology and acting into like acting in marine biology <laughs> movies. Um, like. Dead the dolphin. Right, or like, what was the whale, the whale movie? Free Willy. Free Willy, yeah, that was the, like a high point of my childhood. But um, I also, I mean, in high school and college, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And it was a point, I would say a point of anxiety for me. And I was, yeah, I was like, really interested in the arts, but I had some experiences as a kid where it was a sense of like, those people are artists, those people are creative, and I missed the boat on that. Um, so I'm really grateful that I got different encouragement as I left college and beyond college that, um, that to have a growth mindset, like I could, you know, all of the things I do now, I learned how to do after 25 years old. So, um, and now I'm 36. So it's cool to, um, yeah, the growing opportunity is just endless. So that's what I did say. I didn't know. You don't have to know. Uh, being neurotically goal averse, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I just sort of followed artistic, my fitful artistic um, tendencies and wound up in animation. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. I find that for a lot of creatives, there's always like either a moment or a series of moments that kind of like push us towards the arts and creativity. Um, you know. I give my personal example, it's like growing up listening to Michael Jackson and seeing Michael Jackson be his music video, I was like, oh man, music, yeah, like that's totally for me, and that was like my trajectory from there on out. Share with us one of your like origin moments, you know, like sit around and talk about you knew from day one you yeah. wanted to be an artist. Like, I would love to know like how you knew from such a nascent time. I think like when I was a little kid, I, uh, for some reason, uh, uh, I was attracted to cartoons, and I feel like when I say I was attracted to them, I feel like not that that I, I wanted to have sex with them or anything like that, but I, I definitely felt like when I looked at a cartoon, there was some kind of symmetry, there was some kind of attractiveness to, to, that inspired me. I was really kind of like deeply, deeply into it. Uh, and so that's what I kind of am into now. Uh, I kind of reach back to my childhood, but when I was a childhood, Hanna Barbera, everything that they made, I was obsessed with. And then when I got a little bit older, um, Todd McFarlane came out, and everything he made, I was super obsessed with. So my work ends up being kind of like a lot when I was young, being like this mix of like Scooby Doo and Spawn, you know. And then it kind of morphed out of that to, to more Scooby Doo. But, yeah. Thank you. Just go ahead and line, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, I also liked cartoons a lot growing up, which I think is a pretty common thread maybe. Um, I feel like uh, as I got older, I tried to, I had this very rational right side of my brain that was trying to sort of fit this art in this box. So this is why I landed on graphic design because I thought, well, this is a bit more sort of structured. There's a bit more rules for me to follow, which is like, <laughs> I guess, you know, Virgo type. I need, I need that structure. So it's kind of where I landed graphic design, but then I sort of wound my way back out of that. So I feel like, you know, just because I studied that, I found that there was a way to connect sort of my childhood love of things that were more, you know, cartoon-like, illustrative, with this um, sort of desire for rigor and speaking to sort of like maybe more of a commercial side. And that's how I got into illustration because I think that's a really nice mix of, you know not being a pure fine artist. Uh, you mm -hmm. still have some sort of business commercial needs, but you can still express yourself in a way, so that's kind of how I landed where I am. And mm -hmm. what cartoons did you enjoy? Uh, it looks like Ghibli stuff growing up in anime. Yeah. Okay. 
you want to give any shout outs to any specific animes? Uh, well, growing up, Sailor Moon was obviously very formative on me. The Pokemon series, I watched a lot of that when I was really young. And then getting older, there's like a lot of more like, kind of like adult shows like, like Foodie Kuri and you know, the mainstays. And then Jubilee movies, I love Kiki's Delivery Service she has a cat, she's a witch, I wanted to do that, and there's bread in it, I love bread, so anyway, that's like one of my <laughs> favorite ones for those reasons. But, Wonderful. Yeah. Just on the sound check, can everyone hear the panelists in the back? Okay, thank you so much for that, let's continue. Okay. Do you want to go? Oh, let's do it in order. <laughs> okay. Maybe it's just don't. It's, like, um, it's like walking the plank. Just yeah. The next. Yeah. Um, I really, there were these kids' books I remember loving as a kid, Stephen Kellogg, he did these, I don't know if anyone's read those, Pinkerton, The Great Dane, and then these books, um, just a mix of ink and watercolor, um, super magical, and I, that is still kind of my aesthetic for my own personal sketchbooks and journals, um, I never got over that. And as far as Related to what I do now, um, there's a writer, Danny Gregory, who put out a book, um, Every Day Matters, and his story is really interesting. He was a designer. Um, I was really, was really moved by his story. He was a designer, and his wife had an accident. She became paralyzed, and so he had to take care of her all day, and he got through that initial period by drawing everything in his apartment and writing a little passage about the experience of drawing it. And um, something, I think that was my initial aha about having visuals with text in a way that like, both are complementary and meaningful and um, how, yeah, just visuals bring life in, in such a different way. Um, and then I found out about, probably my biggest aha was when I was doing informational interviewing to find some sort of job I would like. I literally, like, on a piece of paper, like, designed information together with text, and someone was like, that's a job. You can do that for people. Like, you do little cartoons next to those themes, that's a job. So I did a couple more interviews and started, um, started working in that world. Um, <clears throat> yeah, cartoons. Uh, I'm a product of, uh, when Independent Station's got a lot of old collective libraries of animation. CBS leased all its Warner Brothers stuff in the 70s. It was just rotting on the shelf at Warner Brothers. And suddenly that blew every kid's mind. Uh, and uh, that, it, it was strange, you know, the, the local kid uh, cartoon show with the host clown. I don't know, you're from Seattle, J.B. Patches. Uh, he just had access to this crazy eclectic stuff. And it's, it's, you now have access to it all on the internet. However, it's something slightly different when you hunt it out uh, or you go to the, the, the art house theater downtown Seattle and you watch Fellini when you're a kid and it just blows your mind. And you, uh, uh, another big uh, influence, the, one of the aha moments was meeting a cartoonist at a, at, the, at a Seattle newspaper who I liked. He invited me to his office and he actually showed him my artwork and he said, oh, you might like this book on Animation by Preston Blair. It was like one of those paper books you'd get in a in a uh, art supply store. That paint horse heads, paint seascapes. Yeah, yeah. How to draw this or that? You know. This one was on animation. It was the and it was the gold standard for people learning animation. No one was documenting how to do it back in those days. It was from the '40s, and it completely taught me how to animate. And that's really a fork in the road for me. Thank you, panel. I always find it really interesting, you know, when, when I work with all of you, you all have a story, you all have an experience, you all have like an origin moment, right? Like a lot of the superheroes and comic books and cartoons that we grew up enjoying. So I always really take great pleasure in hearing y'all's origin stories. So thank you for that. Panelists, and I'd like to start with Charlie so it doesn't feel like he's walking the plank. Um, what was your first non cutting art job? Sorry, what was, what was your first like non art or creative job? Oh, by the way, I said CBS leased. I meant Warner Brothers leased it to CBS. Anyway. Correct. Thank you. Your first non-creative arts job. My first non-creative art job? Yeah. You know, everyone has like a job either working in a grocery store, or movie theater. Non-creative? Yeah. But it's art. No, non-creative, non-art. Oh, non-art. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Well, there was, uh, you know, tearing up blackberries bushes for neighbors and burning them. Up, uh, uh, caddying, that was a real kicker. Working as an 11-year-old at a private country club in Everett, Washington, and it was the most eye-opening view of the adult world. To watch a bunch of drunk, old, rich guys argue with each other, mind-boggling. So, it taught me so much, and plus we were just like, we were like unleashed wild animals on that golf course. We would just screw around all day and then, you know, earn $3.50 for four hours of work. And we'd blow it on donuts, you know. Oh so it was crazy. No life. That was such a life lesson working that job. Wow. Thanks, John. Um, I worked at a bookstore. My first job was at a bookstore. But then my first, like, job job I think was I worked as a sol uh, saleswoman for uh, a renewable energy company and I later worked for a solar company this was like a wind energy company and so I had a lot of experience with sales which has only served me as I worked for myself negotiated contracts um, yeah met strangers talk to strangers, ask strangers for help, all those things. Um, so I guess my first non, is, it was arts or creative tangential job was, uh, I don't know if anyone remembers, like they had portrait studios at the mall, like the JCPenney. Yeah. yeah. I was one of the photographers. Hell yeah. It was not fun. <laughs> I think it was like a combination of your two jobs, which is sales, like we always had to upsell, you know, portrait packages. And then instead of watching you know, a bunch of drunk, rich white people, it's dealing with a bunch of upset children <laughs> and their mothers who were, uh, yes, very intent on having their children look beautiful, which I understand, but sometimes you can't make a two-year-old smile on command. Oh my God. Anyway, so it was a good experience. I learned a lot about business, about, <laughs> about uh, working with babies, while you're carrying like a really heavy you know, DSLR camera and like a little thing on one hand. So yeah, kind of client-facing, I feel like some of those skills come in handy now. <laughs> What's one of the skills you believe from that comes in handy now? I mean, it's kind of like salesmanship, right? Like, uh, you know, in my job, there's working with a lot of uh, different clients and people who have different needs, and you have to kind of learn how to sell things to them to sort of get your work through, you know, as unscathed as possible, as <laughs> little changes as possible. So, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm from Ohio, so I mean, I had jobs since I was 16, you know, working in Putt Putt and, and delivering pizza and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, to maybe to to, to have a teachable moment, I, I, I feel like one of my jobs that I, that I did that got me through school and everything like that, that really didn't have anything to do with art, but really helped me out, and that was working at Kinko's. Because when you're young, you have access to like all those computers, all that software, you can copy your artwork, you can get color copies, all that stuff. It really helped me uh, with my art in an unbelievable way. Um, and the more you work there, the more stuff you learn. Um, you get yourself in situations and learn other people's uh, problems. So it was a job that had nothing to do with art, but I'll have to say it benefited me in a lot of ways. And so, I, yeah, it's just like uh, if you have to work, which everybody has to, try to find something that has some kind of like parallel or some kind of tangential connection. Thank you, Pamela. So the data continues to show every experience prepares you for the next experience. So right now some of you might be working jobs and you don't see the direct connection to your creative work. I promise you there's a connection. You have to see it. Panelists, tell us about your first animation or illustration gig. And anyone can start. Money, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I did. I dabbled in in school and was doing some stuff. Um, one of them was for a, a filmmaker in the bottom of the museum on the University of Campus. He was in the basement. Henry? Henry yeah, the Henry. Henry. Yep. Oh my God. And uh, he was making um, archaeology, archaeological kind of films. And so I was doing artwork, and I sculpted some glaciers on a map uh, that were of different eras. Um, I was shooting, doing, 
And then one of his friends was doing a documentary on some sort of, I can't even remember what it was for, but I did a whole bunch of clay animation for that film and got paid. Just did it in the garage with a, he loaned me a camera. More than 350 for four hours of work? <laughs> well, no, it's animation, so it still works out to about three hours <laughs> for four hours. Oh my God. Thank you, Charlie. I think one of my first job, I mean, I did a lot of work that didn't pay at the beginning, which, I don't know, my jury's out. I think that's important. I also think it sucks. Yeah, I don't know, long conversation. I'm sure all of you have thoughts about that. But um, my first big job was I worked for this company called SAP, which is kind of like Microsoft, but they make software behind the scenes for companies like internal relations software. And so it was in Las Vegas. It was the first time I was like flown somewhere, put up in a hotel to do this work, the visual note taking. And my memory of that experience was like, it's a software company and everyone talked so, they spoke so fast. Half of the words I didn't understand because it was internal lingo. And I remember that my markers, you know, I have these markers from, uh, Germany that are refillable and like they were running out and the ink was upstairs in my room of the hotel and it was just a total mess in my mind and they were completely happy with it and I stamped my website with the fact that I had worked for SAP and I kept going um, and it felt like a real like fake it till I make it kind of situation and I've had a lot of those and it taught me also like the most What's most important is my connection to the client, showing that I'm there to support them, and um, yeah, and take requests and offer ideas. And if, if the client felt good about that, then they would usually feel great about the work too. Uh, so I think my first paid creative job was actually at the tail end of college. Um, I was. I think I was taking some kind of informatics class because I was like, product design, that's a thing now. I should know like something about that and that kind of thing. So, um, but my professor at the time, uh, he was working on a game with one of his uh, graduate students that was designed to teach kids how to program. And so they needed art for it, like illustrations and little character designs. So uh, yeah, that was like a three month gig, like right out of school. It was really great. Like I learned to work with, you know, an engineer, like a programmer and like the designer of the game and kind of seeing kids sort of be able to interact with it and play it and like, you know, get some joy, hope out of the illustrations. That was like pretty fulfilling. It's pretty rewarding experience. And you never your way into that room. <laughs> I guess so. Uh, first paid job, I was 24, uh, just moved to San Francisco. I worked in San Rafael at a software development company uh, making children's educational software. I got hired on my first project, interning for six months on this project, which Paul Allen funded this uh, research uh, group called Purple Moon to find out like how girls play video games. So that was the first project I got on. It was not really all that good to girls because it was just like, they wanted to like go look in people's lockers and stuff like that. So my first animation job was like going down halls, opening up every person's locker, and then trying to figure out like what would be in somebody's locker, and then doing animations of stuff in people's lockers, like notebooks and you know looking at people's diaries, and you know it was really kind of uh, 2D. I'm very old, so this was CD-ROMs actually. So it was just 2D art that we were just like switching to the next scene to the next scene. So it wasn't even really all that interesting animation. But it was my first job. I, I got hired uh, after the six months, but uh, 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 they didn't put me on really any projects until after that six months. And uh, I worked there for two years, and then uh, uh, I haven't had a job since then. <laughs> what was your name, by the way? Uh, Purple Moon was uh, the name of the game. The, the, the company, uh, Versage. Versage. And it was just the developer. Oh, sorry. Oh, I have a follow-up question. Uh, <laughs> well, Purple Moon was like a, it, they, they were meant for like, like six and seven and eight year olds, but the, they, they were like a junior high school and uh, Rocket was the main girl and it was like a series of kids and uh, you were able to go in every student's locker, you were able to 
go into the students or the teacher's lounge and look into the teacher's uh, mailboxes. And it was a choose your own adventure game. So like say you were in the stall, going to the bathroom, and then two girls walked in and you heard them talk about you, they talk about you. Then boom, you have this choice. Do you go out there and you confront them or do you stay in the stall, let them leave, whatever. At the end of the game, do you like have a bunch of friends or not? Like I said, it wasn't necessarily all that good. Oh my God. Um, uh, but you know, uh, it was my first game. They made toys. I worked on that project for like a couple of years. They made like rocket play soccer, so I did some animations for soccer and stuff like that. Um, but I did a lot of uh, animations, like uh, just simple 2D animations that kind of got my start making video games. Yeah, out in Santa Fe. Uh, took the bus out there from San Francisco every day. So I was like, yeah, it was real. You were hungry. Yeah, thank you, panelists. All right, uh, next question. What is the most important non-technical skill be successful in your world. What is the most important non-technical skill to be successful in your world? You have to be consistent. I think, I think like the one thing that, that I learned when I was re really young, but what I tried to do is I tried to grow a plant. Because if you can grow a plant, it's like the first like thing where you can prove to yourself that you can consistently focus on something every day and see an outcome. And the plant was like one of the first things where I was just like, man, I can pretty much do whatever I want, as long as I focus on it every day, and just be super consistent. I exercise a lot, I focus on uh, uh, being consistent about my kind of routines. My work is never consistent, I'm lucky with that, it always changes, but uh, everything else I try to keep, uh, uh, I just try to keep consistent, try to keep things like on a rhythm. I may ask a follow-up question. I think I've observed that a lot of creative people, discipline to be consistent can be a challenge, or a shadow side to the like that is our creativity. What tips would you have the studio audience to help kind of like hone in that discipline or implement the discipline? I, I, I just feel like, to be honest, you exercise is like one of the best things. Just because like, if, if you're really tired, then you can really focus on other things. I feel like your body gets in the way. I feel like self-care is super important to be a creative person, personally. Just because I feel like your brain is where you're getting like all your good stuff from. And also it teaches you kind of how to separate yourself from your work and judge it after the fact because you're a different person when you're making work and you're like all focused on it and then you feel like you're done. You come back the next day, it's like different. If you put like some kind of like schedule or some kind of rhythm in your life, it works with your work. You can separate, you can go back, work out, go for a walk or whatever, come back with a different perspective. Um, art is just like, you get too married to it and you can't see its faults and uh, it's healthy to kind of be able to create a lifestyle around that uh, supporting you judging yourself and, and producing that work. Thank you. I have another C to add to that, so we have consistency. Uh, I think communication is huge. Uh, unless you really want to make your art in a bubble, just keep it to yourself, and that's totally fine. Uh, I've learned that, you know, I, I used to think, oh, my art can speak for itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I find that I have to, like, learn to explain my decisions or be able to, like, sell it to someone, be able to, you know, just convey, you know, what it is. Uh, at least in my line of work, that's really important to be able to, you know, either put it in writing, say it in person, be, like, clear about what the goals are or something of a piece uh, and, you know, why you made the decisions you made. And I think that I learned, I had to learn that. <laughs> like, in the working world, it's kind of harder, I feel like, to do sometimes in an academic sort of environment. But, uh, you know, I think, like, stuff like critiques and, I don't know, part of the curriculum, but you know, just sort of that kind of feedback loop and learning how to articulate your ideas is really important. Let's ask the studio audience. Hey, studio audience, are critiques part of the curriculum here at City College? Yeah. yeah. So I would love to know, Annie, tell us a little bit about what it's like to do work at Fortune 500 company and, you know, kind of like have to defend your artwork to <laughs> people who may or not even have an understanding of creativity in general. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, it's a very good uh, skill that I've learned and am learning um, still. So uh, I think, you know, on our end, we've learned how to uh, work from a creative brief. Uh, this is something that we like to collaborate. It's another C, collaboration. <laughs> uh, with kind of whoever is quote unquote requesting the artwork because um, we know that they have goals and we have our goals, and generally our goals are just to have integrity to our style and to how things look and feel. But they will have different goals. Um, there might be more metrics oriented. Like we need to 
sort of have this many people sign up or not lose this many people, you know, in this flow or whatever. So usually we just sit down, we kind of talk through that with them. Um, and I think we've learned to sort of justify a lot of the decisions we make from an artistic standpoint, but in a language that they will understand. So if it's more like a business oriented audience, we'll be like, well, we need to keep our style consistent because we need people to recognize that this is the brand, this is our product, you know, and so kind of learning a lot of that language, putting it in writing, you know, you have this source of truth and then it could be like, hey, you know, you're saying these things now, but if you look back at our process, like we agreed on this, because that's another thing that happens is like, if you don't have these sort of guidelines in place, people will kind of just, especially people who are used to working with creatives, they'll kind of not know how to give feedback or kind of give it from a place that's actually very emotional. And so we have to be like, hey, we discussed this, these are the things we're gonna do, like these were the goals, you know, if you want to do this, this actually is gonna make it seem, you know, it's like more like this. So. Honestly, I just like talking to people, establishing things up front, having this things in writing is always very important, uh, documenting your process, and yeah, usually, you know, it's a very, it's still a very fluid process, kind of working with people, but um, I think, you know, having a bit of that structure has generally kept us on track and able to stick to our guns and still incorporate um, people's feedback. Cool. I wanna hop on what you were saying, Saron, about schedule and discipline, you know, I feel like I'm somebody, I, I do really well when I have a structure and I have a really hard time following a structure that I set up. So this idea I read about like cracking the code of my own nervous system was like such a big thing when I learned that I could have a day where I worked from home, but then the next day I'm probably gonna wanna work at the studio. And then I could reserve a totally different day where I'm doing more external interactive things and meetings and I can like decide where my time goes. I can say at one point I'm like no meetings before 11 a.m. because 9 to 11 is my best focus time to just plow through. So the idea of like cracking the code of my own nervous system and observing like when am I really focused, um, when is a great time for me to like interact with other people and work on stuff. Like I know, I try to have meetings in the afternoon because after like three or four p.m., if I'm not interacting, like I just can't generate much stuff. Um, and then I think the time tracking is huge. Also, when I'm trying to scope a project, just beyond huge because often I find my tendency is to say, "Oh yeah, I can do that in five hours," when in fact it consistently will always take me ten but the person wants to only spend five hours worth of budget, you know? So like having some time tracking that I can look back on um, is really helpful. So I can say, okay, so you have five hours. This is what we can do in five hours. It's gonna be half of the vision you have. Um, and or like, sorry, I can't work with you because it's not gonna be doable. Um, yeah, that's very helpful. I'm not picking one thing, but I, yeah, I agree with all these things. Having things in writing, like, yeah, having focus time. I love the Pomodoro method. Does anyone know that? It's like the Italian timer um, with a tomato in Italy, and it's like a 25 minute timer. And the idea of like doing one thing for 25 minutes and then having a break, or, you know, finding an amount of time that's an amount of time to focus, like for me it's an hour and 15 minutes. Like an hour and 15 minutes of focus and then 15 or 30 minutes off. Um, but yeah, that time is when my cell phone is off, I'm not checking my email, I'm just um, working on a project. So that's been really helpful. Thank you, Helen. Non-technical skill. <coughs> um, the one that served me so well is just tapping into a community and kind of mm. leveraging and supporting it. Um, mm. I've only gotten work by chit-chatting with people and then supporting them on their job and then uh, get a word of mouth reference and I get you know, work from that. And lifelong relationships, uh, you know, for, for I feel super lucky that I work in this field where the people that I work with, the vast majority of them, 
are the people I want to hang out with and that mm -hmm. I end up having spending holidays with. I mean, it's really weird. But it's like I've like I've been in San Francisco now for about 30 years, coming down from Seattle, and this huge animation art artist community around town is they're just full of wonderful people, and they've kind of spread out, you know, depending on what's going on in town. Like a lot of people went up to Oregon to work with Leica, and uh, you know, down to LA somewhat. But um, people keep like swimming around. It's like a big salmon run. Yeah. Charlie, can you tell the studio audience where we, they could find this salmon run? <laughs> like some snow Everywhere you turn and, and talk, you know, it's like, it, what's that phrase? Um, expect nothing, appreciate everything. Mm. And I think you just walk, you just uh, approach everybody like that, and um, you wind up fostering a lot of uh, bonds, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, studio honest, this is going to be my last question for the panelists, so make sure you start writing down your questions on those note cards. We're going to collect them in a minute. Panelists, I would love to hear the best piece of career advice you ever received. The best piece of career advice you ever received. And I'd like to start with Melanie. OK. Uh, don't quit before the miracle. Yeah, that's a good one. Can you unpack that for us? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, it's actually, yeah, don't quit before the miracle, as in maybe I'm not going to be able to see where I am on the path, and it doesn't look clear, or it doesn't look like it's going forward or up, but um, like continue to listen, listen to the next right step, listen for wisdom, and know that um, yeah, creating what my vision is, is inevitable if I keep walking. So d don't stop before I see my vision start to bloom. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> I also, wait, I just wanna say, I also, in sales, they say it takes seven, an average, an average of seven follow-ups before someone says they wanna work with you and they sign a contract. Meaning, some people will say yes after one follow-up, and some people take 15. That was very helpful to learn. Awesome. I guess um, this isn't like, you know, I can't pinpoint a person or moment that this was expressed to me, but I feel like it's just like a personal thing that I've learned is sort of, you know, just don't be kind of afraid to try Things. So things being like reaching out to people, like one of the things when I was, you know, right out of school, and I was like, wow, there's these illustrators or artists that I admire, and you know, but I'm scared to talk to them or just mm -hmm. email them, even though I was like, because they're they're over here and like, you know, very intimidating, put them on a pedestal. So, you know, just like try. Like I found that, um, you know, I, they don't always respond, and that's fine. And then, but the ones that do, they, you know, it's just. People are a lot nicer than you think. Um, there's a lot more opportunities out there uh, if you just don't shoot yourself down first, you know, before you go do something. So it's kind of generic, but I feel like it's top of mind and something that has helped to me sort of open doors, you know, make connections. And yeah, and like, you know, people, I always love when people reach out to me because it's just like, it's at being on the other side now, maybe, I guess, it's like, oh, it's so nice that someone thought that I had something to, you know, a value to offer. So, you know, don't be afraid to do that. I would just like to interject that that exact mindset is what brought this young man here to us today. If I had known that one day I was riding my bike at like 6 a.m. to the gym, Mission Cliffs, and you were working on your housing mural, wow. like on Brian and 18, and then like I was just like watching, I'm like, wow, oh, I wonder if that's him. And then you like looked right at me, and you like waved at me. I was like, oh my god. And then now he's here, <laughs> you know? It just kind of shows you the power of being uncomfortable can lead to really great things. And this is for you, you know? And that's why Fanny's here too, because yeah. I yeah. looked at Fanny <laughs> on Instagram and I was like, I want to do more illustration with a team. Would, can I take you out for coffee to learn about what it's like to work on a team? And Fanny's like, yeah, which I was like, what? And then we sat down. And then Aria's like, who are the other cool illustrators you know? <laughs> and I was like, hey, something's happening. 
Gentlemen of animation. Mm. G O A. I can't think of a damn thing. I've been told that I think, think of a tone that people had that I admired, where they made it comfortable to be around. They were funny, amusing, supportive. That was just sort of a non-specific in, uh, phrases, but I just mean the the tone has been really important. Mm. Um, and I, I'll just steal one from John Waters. Uh, he said, if I didn't work this hard for myself, I'd have to do it for somebody else. And it's stuff like that that makes me realize, it sort of jibes with, um, I mean, I, I, I gave away so much work. <laughs> I mean, I studied so much, uh, like in the basement of this film lab, learning motion control and learning how film effects worked and uh, just, just trying to figure stuff out and um, having that kind of motivation has been really helpful, even though I know it's sort of counter to what people want when they say, no, you got to get paid for what you do. Got to get paid for what you do. Yeah, on a good day. Thanks, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, create something that everybody's familiar with that nobody's ever seen. Um, hmm. You know who said that? I said that. <laughs> Low hanging fruit, okay? Low hanging fruit. It's my advice. Like, when you're trying to struggle for an idea, it's like everybody wants to try to grab the apples on top of the tree, when really the stuff that's really the easiest that's really going to solve your problems like right in front of you. Low hanging fruit first and then work on all that high stuff. Whenever you're trying to creatively problem solve, usually just go for the simple stuff and then everything builds on top of that simple stuff. I honestly like being an African American artist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's not that really many people, I didn't grow up with any. I, didn't, I don't really have that many peers, especially doing the work that I do. Um, I don't live in LA, so I don't really, I didn't grow up with any mentors. Uh, any, any people with examples, uh, everything that I know about being an artist is uh, just what I've experienced in my own life. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, panelists. Studio audience, we're going to take about a 10 to 15 minute break. Please finish writing your note card questions and then pass them. Looks like the majority of you are sitting that way. So that would be to your left. I will come and collect them. 10 15 minute break. Production team starting now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for the second half of Workforce Wednesday Careers in Animation and Illustration. I'm your host, Ari Zanko. We're here with the wonderful, wonderful panelists. Question the first. What? Oh. <laughs> what advice would you give to create a strong portfolio when applying for a job within the animation industry? What advice would you give to create a strong portfolio when applying for a job within the animation industry? I'll be taking notes. Wow, I'm kind of an outsider in that regard, that I'm an independent uh, animator. Uh, however, uh, examples of uh, animation um, that you've, with clear indications of what you've been able to do on it, and just maybe a progression of, of how it was conceived and the steps you go through, that's always helpful. Maybe that's really obvious. So kind of like telling the story like, of your work? Well, here's my thumbnails, here's where the layout, here's the, here's some of the design changes that I figured out. Um, here's the animatic that the client bought off on. Here's some change we had to make. Here's the finish. Cool. Is that in your portfolio too? I always have it on the website. I don't even have a portfolio. Uh, nor do I have a, a show real <laughs> I just have a website, I just direct people to that. It's just a plain old website, but I always have a progression where uh, it's interesting, where it seems like it would be interesting. You know, here, are the, here are the thumbnail boards, here's the figure it out. Just to show, just to help people understand, that's one of the big reasons why I do it, is because the client will then understand the process and it becomes really clear really quickly. Thank you. And can you give the studio audience your website to go around for them to take a look? Sure. CharlieCanfield.com. How's Canfield spelled? Like C A N F I P L D. Perfect. Hey, so, Ron. Uh, uh, I'm not a big 
criticize the question, but it's just too broad. So like, you know, when it comes to animation, there's millions of different jobs. I mean, you know, you could be a character designer, they don't animate. Background designer, they don't animate. You could have a kid, you know, a keyframe artist, they animate. You could have uh, a storyboard artist, uh, they kind of animate. Um, uh, and some of the people that do storyboard artists wouldn't be doing keyframes uh, because they just don't have the skills. So it depends on what kind of artist you want to be. Um, it depends on what skills that you have. Like if you're a really good character designer but you're not in animation, then lean into being character designer and then you know make an animation portfolio based on that, which more than likely wouldn't entail a reel. If you're really interested in animation, then you've got to have a reel. A reel is going to be 2D or 3D animation that's that's either wireframed or black and white. It doesn't have to be full color, um, but just you know seconds of just showing that your animation skills are that, and then that means that you want to be an animator, not a character designer, background designer, or storyboard artist, or blah blah. blah. That's wonderful. Thank you for that specificity and unpacking. Um, a lot of times, the creatives have a really hard time narrowing down like what is the thing I'm really good at, you know. Um, what resources would you suggest for them to use to like figure out? Because you know, like you said, because we're so married to the work, we don't see it, we don't see like what is its shadow, what is light. Like, how can some of the studio audience members figure out like what is what is my superpower in this world? I, I think that's a really good question. Um, I mean, you're all young, so you you have an opportunity. Um, I don't know. Some of you might might be at a certain age, or you might be just like, I need to like shit or get off the pot. But I mean, I feel like I feel like. Especially being an artist, I'd say it again, like low hanging fruit. I mean, we all have some kind of skill, and like if we're doing some kind of illustration, no one's going to care about your illustrations unless they stand out. No one wants to see you know the same thing over and over again. But yet, you still have to deliver something that people are familiar with. You still have to deliver something that people are comfortable with. You can't totally give them something they've never seen before, or else they'll just be off their rocker. So you gotta, you know, you gotta make something new, but you also gotta play into into that thing. And I think the best way to make original art is not stealing off anybody, it's being inspired, but then just being like, this is the best capabilities I have. So even if your, if your animation skills or your uh, drawing skills are limited, that itself will make a style. And if you own whatever you draw, people will respect that. And uh, uh, I think that's the biggest thing. You have to exactly be like, I know it's not the best, but this is my style, and this is what I have to, to deliver. This is all I have. And if you own that and say, this is what I believe, then people will totally accept it. I mean, when you see like uh, Adventure Time, and you see Finn's arms, those arms are totally incorrect. <laughs> Everybody knows that as an artist and an an animator, but you deliver that, and you say, this is how it is, and then people will accept that. Uh, especially if you own it and you're not like, oh, do you like it? It's like, no, this is what I'm showing you. And then boom, that's how you create fresh new stuff. Do you feel like when Spawn came out, like people were off the rocker? Yeah. Well, Spawn, I mean, Spawn was a little bit later in terms of Tom McFarlane. Tom McFarlane made like Batman and he was like a, a, a really big, he used to do G.I. Joe comics, so I was really into his stuff as I was a really little kid. Spawn was more his contemporary. Spawn was when he got famous. When I was really into Todd McFarlane, he wasn't, you know, making toys and being this big empire guy. Um, um, now making, actually in the Guinness Book of World Records, they're actually making 300 comic books. Um, uh, the guy's like a, a, a genius and one of my biggest heroes. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, his older stuff, he just had a style, the way he inked. Um, I was just, uh, again, I was attracted to it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. So, for the too long didn't listen audience out there, um, examples of animation have clear indications of pressure of how it's conceived, i.e., thumbnails, layout, design changes, and uh, animatics, in order for the client to understand. CharlieCanfield.com. Canfield spelled can and field. Uh, there are millions of different jobs within animation, so you have to know your specific job goal, and it depends on what kind of artist you want to be based on your strength or your life. Demonstrate what you want to be in this portfolio, being inspired by others and leveraging your best capabilities. Own what you create. I heard it as the best is kind of subjective. If you own it, people will accept it with confidence and with courage. Um, uh, one, uh, one thing though, I, I, were, I was around a lot of people because I worked in the industry. So I was around a lot of people that decided that they wanted to do another job that was, that was not in their skill set. And they worked for years and years and years, and even though they were in the periphery of that, they eventually got there. But I remember specifically 
being like, man, I would not want to like start to become like a character designer when I'm just like a, I'm just like, I knew this 3D animator, he was doing 3D animation and compositing, and he wanted to become like a character designer. Totally like, totally two different jobs, man. I mean, he had to start from the very beginning. But man, that guy's over at Leica right now. And I mean, it's been like 15 years, but I, you know, if you're really into something, you can, if you really want that glass of water, you can get that glass of water. You know what I'm saying? Like you can learn um, a skill if you want. So, excellent. Thank you, gentlemen of animation. Um, follow up to that, because that's kind of what I've heard is, how do you make yourself stand out in illustration and, anima and, and animation? It seems like everybody is really trying to do this type of work. Any tips on how to stand out? And anyone in the panel would take that. It's a choice. I know I'm dominating this here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think it's a choice. You have to figure out what kind of artist you're going to be, right? So like, I forget your name again. Fanny? Fanny? Mm -hmm. Fanny. She works for Dropbox. So, we, me and her are almost exactly the same. Because the thing is, is I work for myself, but I never get a chance to do whatever I want. She goes to work every day. She doesn't get a chance to do whatever, whatever she wants. She has to do, she has to toe the line. I have to toe the line. The difference is, is that I spent and said, this is what I'm gonna do, and this is my art, and I'm not gonna work for anybody. I'm just gonna try to focus on my work and try to diversify my career and just make take that sacrifice. And so, <laughs> I have freedom, kinda, but no one's, no one's letting me sit in a room and paint whatever I wanna paint. Every job I gotta do, I gotta listen to somebody, and they tell me what they want. I'm painting blue bears, but they're doing what people want them to do. So, you know, that, that being said, if you're going to be a commercial artist, we're not talking about fine artists, where those, those fools are lucky, where they can go in some room, paint whatever comes out of their heart, and make a lot of money. Personally, I don't have a lot of respect for that, because it doesn't entail hard work, and I feel like, personally, if you work hard, you should be rewarded from that. So that's just how my work ethic rolls. So I kind of more, uh, I kind of more did commercial art, because I know where exactly I stand. Um, you know, if I do fine art, people are like, oh yeah, it's good. Commercial art, you know if you solve the problem or not. And so I like that. It's a safer environment for me to work in. And again, it's like consistency, it's like control. I think my answer would be, how do I stand out? Uh, be easy to work with. Like, have my work out. At one point I was putting up a drawing. I, I couldn't do the schedule of making a drawing every day. So I would go into my studio on Thursdays, and I would make six drawings, and then I would post them through the week, right? So there was like stuff going out every day, where I would remember. I had an alarm on my phone or whatever. So in one of those instances, Instagram saw one of my drawings, and they called me and asked me to come. They called me on Friday night at 6 o'clock. I thought it was like a total spam call. I'm like, hi, this is Instagram. Will you come down on Friday? And I was like, this is ridiculous. They wanted me to fly out on Sunday morning and do uh, portraits for them for an event Monday morning. And um, the reason I think I stood out was because one, I had work that I was putting up on social, like consistent work that they were seeing, they could see my style, but then they could easily contact me. I picked up the phone, I emailed them back promptly, I gave them like a really good contract, clear outline of what the expenses would be, um, wrote them thank you notes afterwards, you know, kept in touch. And I, my experience is that that is what distinguishes someone that's working as an artist and someone that doesn't. Or maybe, I mean, maybe folks don't want to, but I love this term entrepreneurist because like there's an element of entrepreneurship, hustle, that um, goes into making consistent money from my creativity. Um, yeah. That's yeah, I think I sort of piggybacking on that. I think, um, and it's kind of hard to break out of this mindset. But I do feel like in school and like growing up, you have this idea of an artist, and it's all about the work, and that should be enough. And you know, if I'm good enough, someone will notice me or something or I'll ascend to whatever this goal is. But I find that like I've been on the other side of sort of commissioning artists like for our blog and stuff. Um, obviously all of that stuff is super important so you have to think about, I mean this is kind of 
a little cringy, but just sort of how do you market yourself? How do you put yourself out there? How are you doing that? Are you doing it in a smart way? Are you, um, like when you're reaching out to people, are you doing your research? Like, you know, do you really understand what it is that people want? And how do you position yourself to be like, see, this is how I can help you. Like, this is how my art can service this need or whatever this project is. So I think people who stand out are the people who, obviously you have to have good work and that's, you know, we should be focusing on, but that extra layer of just doing your research, having that kind of, you know, being able to speak to a client need or uh, do that research, I think really makes um, kind of creative stand out when we're looking for people. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At one point there was this flip for me, someone articulated like making money is just giving value. So if I can, like the words like marketing are also kind of cringy for me, but if I can focus on like, how can I give value in this situation? How can I best be of service? Then like a lot becomes really clear on how to show up for me. Yeah, I'd echo that stuff. The original question being, what makes you stand out? Um, how to stand out in such a saturated market? Yeah, I think the key is people work with somebody they know or mm -hmm. you're a known quantity somehow, like they know your style or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's just, again, it's the word of mouth thing that I've written for forever. Totally, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Too long didn't listen. It's a choice. You need to figure out what kind of artist you want to be. Sometimes you have to toe the line. Sometimes you can say, I said this one, I'm going to do it, I'm doing it. And doing it with consistency. Be easy to work with, have your work out into the world. Work is going up on social media to see consistent style, easily contactable, clear contract with details. Thank you notes, stay in touch. This is what distinguishes you. AKA all the things creatives suck at. <laughs> Can I add? Please. I suck at a lot of these things that everybody's talking about. Uh, so it's, it's not a given that everybody who's that everybody's lining all these ducks up perfectly. Yeah. It's just a, uh, a matter of getting enough of the ducks. <laughs> <laughs> but you, to be fair, but you spoke a lot to creating relationship and yeah. maintaining mm -hmm. relationship. And to me, like that's what that's like the general theme of any of the stuff I talk about. And I'm terrible at contracts, and I avoid difficult stuff. Uh, but then I'll work back around and somehow solve that. What I omitted back there, I, I, I solved some other way. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not writing thank you notes in a really methodical way, but I'm, you know, socializing with the people. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's the so same. It's, it's not a, it's not a, I'm, it, I think, yeah, the creative being not necessarily good at it still can kind of muscle through. Absolutely. I think for me, what I've observed, and because of my personal entry into the world of creativity, was like I have no background in understanding of music, but I was really good at like coordinating and promoting and booking the shows and all that stuff. So my like responsiveness to emails and you know some of the skill sets that like Melanie was talking about, I think is very important and key. And also to honor what Charlie was saying, it's a muscle that can be developed. Right? Like think about the first time you picked up a pen and paper to draw something. You weren't that great at it, and now you're amazing at it. It's the same thing. It can be taught. It can be learned. As long as you're reflecting and growing. And also, Charlie's strength in this example is he socializes. He connects with people face to face. Yeah. That's his jam. Melanie's superpower in this world is her ability to write a lot of thank you notes. Example, right? <laughs> So or to them. use like Gmail snooze, like yeah, yeah. They told me reach out to them in a month. Like I'm not gonna remember that. Like snooze that shit, and in a month it's gonna come back. Like oh, let me write back to Fanny or whatever. Yeah. There are tools and processes and things to use to help you level up in whatever your shadow is. The trick is can you identify what your shadow is, and then be okay with it and grow from it. Uh, thank you. And then uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. How can I give value in this situation? That helps clarify things. Fanny's points were, how do you put yourself out there in a marketable way? Are you doing research on the market and what the market wants, being able to speak what a client needs? And then Charlie's, who knows you, word of mouth. Amen. All right, thank you so much, panelists. Next question, kind of to piggyback on that. 
Uh, how important, needed, slash helpful uh, is it to curate your own web and social media presence? Is it needed? Is it overrated? How much time do you spend on it? Do you have other people do that for you? I say overrated. <laughs> overrated. I, I say it's super overrated. I make a living off of my reputation, and I have like my 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 niece has like more Instagram followers than I do. <laughs> I know people that that don't do anything in their career, and they have more Instagram followers than me. So I feel like, and I've been on it for like I feel like ten years. So I just don't believe it because. <laughs> I make a living, and it's not because people are uh, calling me and they don't know me. Um, it seems to be the emails, everybody, you know, has a, an idea of who I am when they send an email to me asking me for something. So I'm assuming it's, you know, something else. Um, right. So I don't know. 4,000, you know what I'm saying? That's not that many. You have a presence that people see, and that's the only reason I think social media is at all useful is uh, there, there used to be some sort of central location people can go to and see what you are. You have walls everywhere that people can recognize and see. Maybe uh, that's it. I don't but know. I, I think the, the emphasis on a heavy social media a presence is just, there's a huge blood. I mean, just you know, media influencers, you know, whatever the hell they are. Uh, there's people that have millions of followers. Do you, do you give a shit, you know? I mean, it's just, just so many people like that. What, somehow you have to just have some little central location somebody can go to. Mm, I definitely agree with that. Uh, followers do not pay the bills. Uh, so just as someone has, you know, tens of thousands. Like, I know people who... In a way, maybe it's because they're spending all their time trying to cultivate that, that maybe that they are not working on, on things that I think can net you actual opportunities and collaborations. Uh, just personally, from my experience, like Instagram, sure, like that's a good place for a lot of art directors. They'll source artists through that, but they got a little thumbnail, clicky clicky, you know, I can see it really quickly. But um, personally, like when I, I like to go to people's personal websites. For one, Instagram is just a very fixed ratio. Like that is not how your work is meant to be viewed, usually. So, you know, it's a good little teaser. It's good to have stuff there. Do not invest like all your days and hours trying to cultivate it, get the right hashtag, blah, blah, blah. Like maybe a little bit, but you know, I just get delighted when I see like someone has, you know, a personal website or maybe even like a blog or more they're writing about their thoughts and like who are they as a person. And, that's kind of your own space to design and present your work as you see fit versus like you're kind of trying to fit it in these boxes of like Twitter or Instagram and it's not generally how work is meant to be viewed. So it's kind of just my personal bias, but again, you should probably have something out there and it's purely, mm -hmm. you know, put something out there, but try not to think of it as like the be all end all, the final destination of your artwork. Mm. I feel like this is like an active inquiry for me because I have my other life is I'm a songwriter and performer and I notice it's like way harder for me to interact with social media because it's like my face and my body and it's like nobody's listening or it's just super challenging. So I have two feeds. I think the thing that's most useful is my drawing Instagram like feeds onto my website. So I have my portfolio of like my most favorite pieces and then you can like a tab called today where you can click on that and see stuff that I'm doing this week. I think there's an element of like, oh, she's still making stuff. That's great. I believe that she's a working artist in the world. Um, but then again, I you know, was just advised from someone to take all the dates off of everything on my portfolio. So like nobody knows that some of that shit is from 2011. They just see that it's great. So I don't know. I do think there's something about the more work I make, the more work I get. Like I found that to be really true. Um, but I don't think that is related to followers or likes or anything. I don't, I don't know. I, I have a hard time with the algorithm likes. Like, wait, you said you have like 4,000 followers or something? Like, I have like 500 followers, and Instagram found me on Instagram and hired me. So, like, 
doesn't matter, but maybe if we were... I just, I just, uh, uh, for me personally, I just feel like the world just doesn't work like that. Yeah. And we're trying to fit, we're trying to fit our shoe in this, or our foot in this shoe that isn't meant to be. I mean, I personally think that, you know, life is like random and, um, you know, I think that there's gifts and there's angels and there's events that will direct you in your life. And when you try to like make yourself, people notice you through this thing that you have. Um, I just think it's unauthentic and I just don't think it's uh, really real. But we put a lot of work into it and we put a lot of hope into it. And there's been a lot of success stories that, that motivated us to keep us continuing on with it, um, to prove otherwise. But uh, um, for me personally, as an artist, I've kind of found eventually that it gets in the way of my creativity and my choices um, of, of what I put up there. And uh, um, I do it, I do it kind of begrudging, begrudgingly, but I am very like, I'll only post something that's like super important. Um, I'll, other than that, maybe I'll do some like Instagram stories of my dogs or something like that, because I love my dogs, you know what I'm saying? Um, uh, but other than that, you know, I, 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 I only look at it um, uh, Friday and Saturday and Sunday. That's it. Um, I'll post something during the week if I have something going on. Um, but I only look at it on the weekends and, you know, uh, I feel like, especially young people, I see, especially artists, when you're all like uh, peers, all other artists that are peers, it's rough to see them like, you know, get commissions or, it used to bother me, you know, like all these people doing murals here or doing murals here, you're seeing like everybody and what they're doing, you're in everybody's business. That I don't know how, bit, yeah, I don't know how, how mentally uh, stable that is for artists, right? Because we tend to judge ourselves a lot. We also tend to judge other people. Being artists, we're just, we judge. That's what makes us artists. That's what makes us creative people. So I don't necessarily think that, uh, for, and for me personally, um, uh, it's all that 100% useful. I think that there's a point to it. I think it's great to um, see progress. Um, and so you have a space where you can see your personal progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that's really incredible. And I think that for me personally, I like to show progress to share my uh, painting skills, to share the way I create art. I think that that's important. That's one of the assets of Instagram. So you can see exactly how to paint a piece from beginning to end. So you can see the, the tools that I use and process. Um, I think that's a great asset too, but that's looking at it as a utilitarian object um, that's useful to you. Looking at it as this kind of lottery ticket, I don't know. It's also, I think there's this writer, Maria Popova, and she says like the thing with social media is it's like, it's measuring and codifying something that's nebulous. Like it's saying like, this is valuable or not based on this number of people. And that's problematic. Like we can't, like I can't place a value on my work based on how many hearts it gets. So, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's complicated. All right, it's kind of like Farmville, you know, you spend your whole, <laughs> all your efforts growing this digital stuff, and is there any direct relationship to the What's what Farmville? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just like whatever digital game you foster, or like, what were those robotic baby toys? Tomodachi. Yeah where you spent all your efforts making them not digitally die. <laughs> and I think that's a real internet kind of corollary. That, this, that, that kind of digital feedback you get is that, you know, how does it really translate into your value, what you value? Yeah. It might, but you just have to be aware of it. Because it's, it's, it is very nebulous. It's wow. a bunch of ones, it's a bunch of zeros and ones. That was, that was wonderful, thank you for that. I had a lot of panelists. Um, too long didn't listen. <laughs> Some feel like it's nice and the majority feel like it's overrated. You make a living off your reputation and quality work. Some central location where everyone can go and see your work, maybe not a heavy presence, but a central place for people to see. Followers do not pay the bills, work on the craft, not as much as social media. Instagram should be a good source for art directors. Personal websites are better. Instagram is a fixed space. Something is better than nothing, not the be all end all. Social media can feed to the website. I really like Melanie when you do on your website about the tab that leads to like this week today. That that's a really cool and interesting idea. The more work I make, the more work I get. Social media at times can get in the way about and uh, in the way about what to put up there. 
And social media is like a Tamagotchi you get that. That, was that, is, that is like the analogy. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay, panelists, one word answer, please. Uh -oh. Software, program, or technology that you would recommend for students to have proficiency? Everybody has to learn, has to. Most important thing, illustrator, illustrator, illustrator. Because, because if, you're an illust if, you're, if you're an illustrator, people are gonna wanna turn that into a t-shirt, people are gonna wanna turn that into a poster, whatever. If it's not vector-based, it's worthless. Sorry, <laughs> but, but you, because you only create art once, and you're sitting in there, and you're gonna noodle this great piece of Photoshop, and then, then you gotta like try to vectorize it, and it just ruins the soul of it. So just suck it up, figure out how to get on Illustrator. Um, personally, the, the, the biggest thing right now is iPad Pros. I think that if you're not an artist and don't have an iPad Pro, I think you're missing out. But uh, um, if, you, if you have a Cintiq, or even those cheap ones, they're not that expensive anymore. Um, pen to screen, you gotta get pen to screen, you gotta learn Illustrator. And Illustrator is basically, over the years, has basically turned into Photoshop. They, they're, they're running, it's almost exactly the same. It didn't used to be, but now they're kind of like figuring it out that like people are, are afraid of Illustrator. Uh, trust me, like it, it, I, I, I hate it and it screws up and it's like, a, it's kind of buggy at times, but in the end, your cartoons or whatever you draw will be super crystal clear and the more you learn about it, the more you can get away with cool things and it's just like resolution independent and it's just the way to go. Does anybody, anybody else want to add anything to that? Because that sounded pretty uh, sort of definitive. <laughs> All right. Wait a minute. Are there, oh. What do you have, Sandy? I mean, yeah, I use, I use an iPad Pro, I use Procreate. Um, that's what works for me, because all my stuff ends up digital. Um, so we are trying to actually keep it raster-based, but uh, if you know your dimensions, you know the final context, it's generally fine, make for 4x, 3x, 2x, 1x. Um, but I did start Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator drawing, so obviously it, it is pretty valuable. Um, I don't know, personally I, I feel like software app technology is time management, scheduling, figuring out a good system for that, Google Calendar, uh, I, like a to-do app, like how to actually schedule out projects and yeah, put it in a timeline is really hard, still learning, but a very good skill, I think, to learn a technology or system that works for you, so. I want to hear what you said, yeah. When you said thorough, I thought you meant for that one answer and that you were going to go down. Well, I, I wasn't sure. I, I was inviting y'all to share. Because I want to know how you counter the illustrator. Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm down to learn illustrator, but my experience thus far is that I just don't get it. It's hard. <laughs> but so my I've been learning Figma, which is like Illustrator Lite, I guess. But maybe that sucks. I don't know. But um, I really love Procreate. I think it's awesome. And I'm not. I mean, maybe I could be informed like what I could not do in Procreate that I would need Illustrator for. But I think Procreate is awesome. Uh, it is pretty much the best. I taught. Procreate the last two weekends at the Apple Store uh, in uh, uh, downtown, uh, and, uh, and I taught it there. And they have a bunch of people that actually help you. They're ambassadors that help around the people that are students, and they taught me this stuff in Procreate that I had no idea even existed. So my last project, all my projects I design on Procreate, and then I put them on my computer to do the final uh, because I can't do a vector on an iPad Pro, which is a downfall. But uh, uh, all my designs, like the 100%, like everything I do is done in Procreate this time. Because normally I stopped because I didn't know how to cut and paste in Procreate. Um, uh, I just did not know how to do it. And then uh, those guys taught me how to do it. Now I'm like, I don't even, I don't even get on my computer until the very end. Uh, that Procreate, man, it's just uh, uh, Photoshop missed out. But Procreate is, is pretty much the best thing. You have that and an iPad Pro and the future is yours. You can do high resolution comic books. Procreate now, the new version has animation for nine bucks. iPad's like a thousand bucks. <laughs>
eleven hundred bucks. <laughs> buy it used. Cool. Buy it used. I went from analog paper stuff back a long time ago to digital. I would never try animation any other way besides digital now, unless it was for a lark. <laughs> oh, let's let's pull our hair out. We're <laughs> here working on paper. And the technology changes though, so I don't even know if it matters what I recommend in that regard. However, you saying you didn't know Procreate could do this thing even though you're teaching a class. Internet searches is the most valuable thing you'll ever come across as a working artist. You've got to train yourself. There's no way to learn everything because you're stuck in your own belfry or whatever that phrase is. Your own <laughs> That's the right word. ivory tower. Your own, your own bubble Bell. trying to learn what software does and you're feeling your way through it. But unless you can somehow contact the hive mind, you're stuck. And so that's that's gonna be your salvation for years to come as all this technology comes and goes. And then I started teaching sketching classes with ballpoint pens because so many people don't are, are hung up about and terrified terrified of drawing. And uh, so that's another tool that's really handy is paper and ballpoint pens for the equivalent. Wonderful. Thank you so much, panelists. To uh, too long to listen, Illustrator. If it's not vector based, it's not going to happen. iPad Pro might be missing out. Pen the screen, procreate, procreate, procreate. <laughs> Keep it raster based. Know your final content. Time management tools. I really like this. To do apps, schedule up by timelines. That was really wonderful. Tech think about the technology that serves you. Figma. Internet searches. You need to contact that hive mind, and of course, good old fashioned paper and ballpoint pens. All right. Panelists, <clears throat> how do you find yourself getting or preparing for gigs outside of your normal area of work? For example, could Saran describe how he got recruited to design interfaces for the film After Earth? Oh, that was an old job. Um, uh, yeah, that's a crazy job. Um, well, you know, let's put it this way. Uh, I was painting a mural. No. Yeah, I was painting a mural and this guy that worked uh, um, on that. Any kind of movie stuff is always a uh, contract. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, they'll outsource all the special effects and stuff like that. And uh, the guy uh, was just in a creative jam and uh, um, uh, I got hired there for like a week and a half to like work on uh, this movie, and so it was like a M. Night Shyamalan movie. It wasn't very good, um, but uh, uh, there was just some problem solving, and it was just creative problem solving. I do that a lot that has nothing to do with drawing. There was some drawing, but it's more just like kind of thinking. Um, you know, I'm working on a, a, a Bob's episode right now, Bob's Burgers episode where I'm consulting on. It's just my ideas. Um, it's not even drawings or anything. Yeah. Oh yeah, like speaking of Bob's Burgers, I remember you mentioned earlier that um, maybe you help with every character except for Tina, but then I wrote down, like, I was wondering, like, you know why Tina, even though it's a girl character, but why is she voiced by a man? Uh, because she was a man originally. When we created the show, it was a boy. And so we didn't change the audio, we just uh, changed the character. I was done with the show by that time. It was when Fox bought it, they thought that the ratio was off, so they wanted to change uh, the gender, and so they just kept the voice. They didn't, or else we would have had to redo the whole audio. We would have had to redo the whole uh, uh, first episode. Um, she ends up being like the best character. Do you know what I'm saying? Like she ends up being like this character that I think probably is like uh, revolutionary in a lot of ways. So uh, uh, you know, Lauren is. He's brilliant and he comes from taking comedians and just recording them and editing all that up. So he comes from a different space of creating shows and so that's why he's successful. Awesome. Uh, rest of the panelists, how do you get or prepare for gigs outside of your comfort zone or normal scope of work? Mm, well, I think going back to internet searches, <laughs> it's a very good way to prepare. Is uh, like I remember when I had like an internship, uh, I was doing you know, mostly illustration and some graphic design stuff, but uh, we had to have this sort of capstone project at the end, and I wanted to do animation, very light animation. Um, and so, uh, like, I was like, how do I figure this out using my limited 
sort of toolkit. And so basically what I landed on was like uh, basically rigging stuff in After Effects from Illustrator because that's what I was working on. Like this is the only way I know how. I cannot do traditional like frame by frame animation. And so then lots of just YouTube and like Googling tutorials because yeah, the internet will teach you. But um, yeah, I feel like uh, everything is out there, the knowledge you need. And just, you know, if you have that kind of vision of what it is that you should be doing or want to be doing at the end, I do think you can more or less learn your way to it. If you have friends or community of people who actually are experts in that, that is very helpful. So again, building the network and having the internet hive mind too. So, yeah. I feel like I'm doing that right now because I've been working in this live illustration world and I want to move towards working with a team and like being in a more consistent job instead of just doing freelance stuff. So I've been making a lot more digital work. And I think it was helpful for me, um, my buddy at my studio the other day showed me uh, Dribble and Behance, these two websites that are like just portfolio websites. Because I had a job interview and people just hadn't, I don't think they saw enough digital work to believe that I could do it, which I was, I'm always just shocked by that. Like people just don't think stuff is learnable, but I guess it doesn't look learnable if it's not there. So he was saying, and I think this is a good idea, like picking out the styles that I want to make, like getting a clear sense of the aesthetic I want to move towards, like building a kind of a, um, what's the term? Uh, there's like a, building a file of that um, and being able to just play around. And I do think making a lot of work, I think I showed this company four samples in the style that they wanted, and that wasn't enough for them. So I was like, okay, I don't know, six? <laughs> like, I don't know. So, yeah. Outside the comfort zone, uh, I would just piggyback on what uh, Fanny said. Uh, that's the only way I know prepared. It's just like cram. <laughs> <laughs> and then, Additionally, like she said, she built on, she took an approach based on uh, what she knew, and I just thought of another bit of mentor advice, which I'll tag on here, from Richard Williams, by, I mean, from Disney, but by way of Richard Williams. He said, uh, start with what you know. Yeah. And that, because like for animation, it can be so intimidating because there's millions of things that are, that are branching off into the future, and you don't know how you're going to think ahead to all of them. And you just say, okay, he's got to come in here, and he's got to go out there. Okay, I got that much. Now, what comes in the middle? Or you, and also, it can, you can t translate that to mean, don't be intimidated by how much you don't know, because you don't know most things. It's impossible. I mean, you, you have no hope otherwise, unless you just acknowledge the fact that most things in the universe you do not know. So you start incrementally with what you do know, all you want, but you start a step at a time. Awesome, 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 awesome. Uh, okay, too long to listen. The internet, cram, 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 cram. Go to your tribe. That's why I, you're amongst your tribe, just in case you didn't know. Also, Tim's part of your tribe, Diane's part of your tribe, I'm part of your tribe. Maybe they'll be nice enough, I don't know, to talk to them, maybe. Uh, let's see. Creating practice content that is outside of your scope for later. And then, of course, the formidable yet simple, start with what you know. It can be intimidating to think about the future, so start with the low-hanging fruit. Don't be intimidated by what you don't know. Most things in the universe you don't know work incrementally, incrementally, yeah, okay, from what you do know. All right, get down to the last two questions. We're going to go low, and then we're going to end on a high note. Um, panelists, tell us about like when you thought you weren't going to make it, like when you were like, like you felt like you were six feet underground, you know, like the low point. I think a lot of times we always focus on people's successes. Thank you, social media. We want to see the highlight reel, right? And I know it's really important to talk about like when you were feeling knee high to a duck, right? You wouldn't mind. Uh, uh, 
uh, San Francisco General Hospital and was getting built the Zuckerberg Hospital, they reached out to me and they wanted to put a mural in the pediatric emergency room. Primarily the idea was to like bring all the kids that are going to go there to give them this like sense of community, give this the sense of their environment inside the hospital. Since my murals are all around the mission, it would just make these kids more comfortable. Um, so I worked with the hospital for like three or four months. I designed the whole mural. I was like a week away from starting and the San Francisco Arts Commission came in and pulled the project away from me uh, because it's technically their property. And uh, I had to sit in the Arts Commission office and listen to these, uh, uh, these people uh, talk about my trees and, and my cartoon characters and my trees. It's just my style, but they were like, your trees look like they're gonna fall over and hit someone and we don't yeah. want um, uh, the kids to be traumatized by that uh, and your yeah. bears have like these spaces on them that are kind of devious and nonetheless they took the commission away from me and brought it back six months later with two other artists for me to compete with for this commission so I competed and I tied first tie ever in San Francisco Arts Commission history oh, um, God. so I called them up Noticing or knowing this the whole time that San Francisco Arts Commission did not vote for me, ever. And so I was just let down. Uh, I was let down because I was going into a job um, with this really strong heart. And I was going into it uh, trying to make this difference. And then I had the city kind of uh, pulling it away from me. And, you know, the hospital was on my side the whole time. And we had this vision and even the final version was just watered away just because of the Arts Commission and, and what they did. So, um, you know, especially for someone who's devoted so much uh, time and effort to a city, um, to be uh, smacked in the face by them in that way, um, and treated such dis with such disrespect, even though my intentions were, were gold, um, was a heartbreaking moment for me, and uh, I'm still not over it at all, you know? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, when it comes to the city, uh, I just make sure that if I need anything, I do it myself. Um, because uh, I have connections and I can do whatever I want to do. Um, I just don't need the city. And I want to be able to make sure that I can rip on it whenever I want. And so I'm just not going to need it. Even though, you know, I do, I do things that are tan tan tangential to the city, um, various projects, but, uh, um, you know, I'm working to get there, but uh, it hurt my feelings, without a doubt. Curse you, Zuckerberg! <laughs> Curse you! <laughs> I, can, I can go. Um, so, so, I want to say it's like 2014. I think I was working for this solar company and it was like they wanted to put me on full time and I was like, ah, I don't wanna do that. And so I quit that job and I was like, I'm just gonna do full time illustration. But I hadn't like built that business yet. So I just like leapt into this, you know, seedling of a business and like didn't have steady income and it was the winter and I didn't have community. I didn't have structure. I was dealing with depression. It was like very, very dark. And um, I think it would have been really, if, if my goal was to move towards being self-employed as an illustrator, like building the portfolio, building things while I was like taking care of my own well-being in a solid way underneath that, that would have been the, like the better experience. But um, yes, I remember Saron mentioned exercise, like, that, I mean, it was Aiki, learning Aikido, the martial art, that like got me out of that place. Because that's what was also hard, is, like I couldn't even create, because I was just struggling with so much depression. Um, so now I have some structures in place, like with Aikido and with other health stuff that I don't go there. And I have other structures, like kind of small business structures to just keep me on track with um, building a business. I think, uh, yeah, I think one of the, probably the biggest moments of anxiety and for me and maybe a lot of people is when you're in between jobs because obviously in the society you need money to survive and it's especially hard as a creative because you tie your 
work to like what you're earning, right? Like if you're like, this is what I'm making and this is part of me and it's not, I'm not getting a job. It's so easy to take that personally. Yeah. And so that's something I was learning is just to separate in a way myself from my work, like learn to be like, you know, it's not quote unquote personal that society isn't like hiring me or jobs aren't hiring me. Um, and I think kind of, at least is how I approach things is just try and be very like systematic and clinical about it. So I was like, okay, you know, if like I'm not getting work or something, it's like I'm gonna make a spreadsheet and I'm gonna look at these companies and I'm gonna look at articles and I'm gonna break it down in steps of like what do I need to do to get this thing that I want. And but I also think kind of exploring uh, avenues that, of expression that aren't your main sort of bread and butter. So like you're saying, you got IP, you got like this physical activities, other creative hobbies, music, photography, whatever it is you have. I think leaning into that when you're in the moments of being down because again it's like a lot of our creativity is tied to our personality and kind of like you know sort of we can't make when we're mentally like yeah in a very low place and then you kind of beat yourself about not being able to create which is a very bad cycle so i think yeah learn to be sort of this human outside of your work and have those avenues of expression and like outlet really helpful so don't forget about it um, in one sense uh, the question being uh, how what do you do or what was it like when you didn't know you were going to make it or before well just I think a lot of times we only talk about the success stories and like the pinnacles right and you know I think the biggest trees that we see have the like deepest roots right and a lot of times success comes from being a really low point I just want yeah. the panelists to always share with the studio well, audience, like something that was like low for them. I've never made it. I have yet to make it. I mean, I, it's a moving target. And so I kind of pull my hair out whenever a deadline's approaching. I don't know if I'm going to make it. In fact, I've often thought I, I call myself Skin of My Teeth Productions <laughs> because I just barely, uh, barely pull it out every time. And yet it works and it succeeds and you know, people like it. So, like it. Uh, it's just such a moving target that uh, it, it's it's happening all the time, and it just put, becomes part of the process to not be making it, not be making it. Oh boy, I made it. Okay, I'm not making it. I'm not making it. Okay, I made another one. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> it's it's kind of patterned my life. That I mean, I I've always kind of lived under the radar. Uh, I don't spend a lot of money. That I, I I don't know how people deal in real life as an adult, you know, when they have to take care of the family. Pay a mortgage. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, families, for your candidness. It was really powerful. Um, okay, now the flip side to that. Can you tell us your last professional or artistic experience that made you feel like a kid? In a good way. I assume. Can <laughs> you say that again? Your last gig that made you feel lot, lots of joy, like you were a child again, you know, watching those cartoons. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of a little physical. Um, so I, I don't really get that many opportunities, but I feel like I'm about to, to, to have that feeling. I'm gonna have that feeling today. I pick up my keys to uh, this new uh, gallery that I'm gonna open for like maybe three or four months. So I'm kind of really excited about that. And I know that when I get in there today, I'll feel like a kid walking around in this like big, huge open space so that I can you know do anything I want with. So I guess I'm feeling like that's gonna be coming but lately, um, I've just been so busy that I just go from like one job to the next job to the next job, and I'm even starting to forget like the last one that I did, which is kind of bad. But just more Golden Gate bridges and bears. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell the studio audience where this space will be and when it'll open? How are we gonna find out about it? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna post it on Instagram when I get out of here. Three one three five Twenty Fourth Street. It's this massive space. 
It's like a thousand square feet. I'm gonna open up uh, the 16th of November. So uh, I have exactly 30 days. So I'm gonna start tomorrow. Uh, I'm gonna be in there every day. I'm gonna make art for 30 days, which is a big deal for me because I have not painted for myself in years, thousands of years. I'm gonna be able to literally paint whatever I want to paint. Um, and uh, um, you know, I'm gonna sell it at the end of the month. Um, and I haven't sold a piece, a painting, um, in a long time. Uh, the Disney Museum commissioned a piece, but uh, they have a piece in the new Mickey Mouse show. I don't know if anybody wants to go see that. It's on until uh, January. It's like a celebration of Mickey Mouse. They commissioned like an eight foot piece. That's like the first piece that I've painted and sold. Um, I went to a museum show. It was totally horrible. I hate all that stuff. Um, I'm not into pageantry. I'm not into fine art. Um, because I feel like once I do the art, there's no point in hanging around it um, and sipping wine. It's just not my thing. Um, I'm a production person. If I was DJ in the art thing or something like that, or, or I had some job, or I was painting live, I'm down with that. But just going to an art show is it's just boring. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought. So come to his art show that he thinks will be oh, yeah. boring. <laughs> no, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. I'm going to have art for the next month too. So uh, get my social media, they'll be free. I'm gonna have some adult cartooning classes. Uh, it's a big space, so you know we're gonna do some cartooning classes throughout the month, and then I'm gonna hang everybody's artwork uh, up on the wall. So when we have that opening, uh, everybody can come see their cartoon creations. So yeah, I'm gonna try to make it into a community space and try to give back as much as possible, uh, because uh, this space was given to me, so I'm trying to uh, uh, just share it as much as possible. Between Folsom and Shotwell on 24th Street. Yeah, right next to Phil's. Or Phil's Coffee. It's in college. That's pretty close. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Thank you, so Fanny. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of, like, they always, the kinds of projects that always make me feel really happy, I find recently are the ones that I get to work with other people on. Like, I've done collaborations kind of with my peers. So, I guess one example is. Uh, I started getting invited to kind of like this online group. It's not like, I guess it's kind of like a show, but it's online. Uh, called, it's called Ten By. And so basically, um, it's a bunch of designers and illustrators. And at the end of the year, they compile their top 10 albums that were released that year. And they do their own covers or like album covers for those albums. It's just really fun because it's combining like, you know, love of music with my art. And then I get to see what all my other friends are making and stuff like that, yeah, it's just like super fun, you know, your, your client is yourself, your friends, your personal enjoyment, and I get to listen to music, and kind of, yeah, work on it that way. What's one of those albums? Uh, from last year, this year? Uh, I think one of them from last year was, oh man, why am I picking the one I can't, it's hard, Krumbin, so it's K-H-R-U-A-N-G-B-I-N, uh, it's a Thai word, um, I think it means airplane, but they are a psychedelic funk rock. <laughs> from Texas? Yeah. Anyway, one of the albums last year was really good. K-H-R-U-A-N-G-B-I-N. Probably butchered that. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you, Fanny. Melanie. Um, two things come to mind. Aria and I worked on a project together taking the like the modules from the career search thing, and I made visual notes for them. That was super fun, because Aria's metaphors are just so wacky. I think all of everyone's like, in this room, well, you guys haven't heard it. Like, Ari's like, oh, you're a pitch of who you are. It's like the mullet. Like, you know, business in front, party in the back. So I got to draw mullets and pineapples <laughs> and just lots of fun stuff. And that, so that was really fun. Um, and then also, I did a residency this year for music and just had the chance to take out my sketchbook and do watercolor and ink stuff. And I actually really like, I'm just doing, I have a sketchbook that whatever I do in there, I don't put on social media. And it just feels like a really fun thing to have like this space that's just mine. Um, and I love, yeah, the drawing I do, you know, it's about drawing something quick and drawing something cartoony, but I love Give it, I don't do it as much, but I love it when I give myself the time to like spend 30, 40 minutes drawing one thing. It's like super meditative and fun. And yeah, so 
personal work, a plug for personal work. Yeah. Um, I kind of feel like a kid when I start, finally start getting solutions that are acceptable to me. <laughs> uh, and so it's just an ongoing thing. Uh, with animation being so time intensive and with so many decisions to make, the doubt can just be over, just, could just be paralyzing. And as soon as I remember to doubt the doubt, mm. then I start having solutions and I go, yeah, 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 well, that's cool, yeah. And then I just, I start getting uh, into a creative mode that's, uh, where I'm really appreciating making something from nothing. Um, but that's, it's such a, it's again, it's a moving target. Awesome. Thank you, panelists. The final question, and very important, that we all really want to know is for Charlie Canfield, <laughs> are you a Scorpio? <laughs> <laughs> Ding. Yeah! <laughs> Whoever that was, are you? Yeah. Whoever that was, I hope they're here. I don't know how you did it. That was absolutely brilliant. I love it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, all of you around the I want to now give a special shout out to Woody and Kyle, the production team. The video came edited and then thrown up on our website, the YouTube, and then link to City Thoughts. And of course, I cannot forget Team Outreach, Oma, Sunny, and Michaela. Thank you for watching them. Thank you so much for everybody. Your hard work, YouTube's hard work, panelists, thank you so much. My name is Ari Zarek. Don't forget shout out to Merrington bringing the animation class. Stay gentle, stay dangerous. We'll see you next month. Career to photography. If you're interested, don't start me. Have a great rest of your night.